finally fallen asleep. <lacht> ja? Wie sieht's aus, junger Mann? <lacht> okay, so now let's talk about the plant pathogens um, divided into those two groups, tomato and lettuce. I will show you several pictures. When preparing this kind of speech, um, I somehow felt like a thief because, of course, we don't have all those symptoms that I display right now at our lab. So I had to steal from colleagues, from the internet, and so on. So please forgive me if I have the one or the other picture that is not correctly cited. It is not my purpose to put my name on it, but it's just, in that case, bad work. <laughs> Good. So let's start pathogens. Again, causes for abnormal symptoms. We had them in the to uh, talk before, biotic and abiotic. Um, but what, what, is, what is what? Here's some examples. A nice lettuce plant with some of these brown necrosis. The headlight line already says it is light. The cause of this damage was light. Has anybody an idea how this damage could be produced? Pardon? Yes, that's one. But there's another one. Most people don't know. Is it too much light or too less? Part of both. <laughs> yes, it, it has to do with that. It has to do with that. And it is again cultivar specific. Not every cultivar displays these kind of symptoms if you apply artificial light for, let's say, 10 or 12 hours a day in winter and then switch it off. Then you get those symptoms. Full light and from one second to the other, boof, darkness. Some lettuce cultivars display this kind of symptoms. It can even grow <laughs> if you do it too often. Yes. Um, the theory is that in this case, due to the 100% of photosynthesis and switch off the light, you lose your energy source. So the plant is not capable in discarding all the H2, H2O2 that is produced. And this, yes, and this brings the symptoms. A theory. I haven't checked it for myself. <laughs> Other abiotic stresses, these ones, looking a bit similar, like the ones that I displayed first, but now it is temperature. Just temperature, stress, heat. And now there's nutrients. We have nitrogen deficiency in lettuce. Control, okay, and the deficiency plant. The same in tomato. Okay, and too low of nitrogen. It doesn't look very healthy, does it? But you need to know that this is not a pathogen. Remember maybe the picture of the first talk there was a lettuce plant that looked quite similar to this, and it was Botrytis. But the other way around works also. This is lettuce with a nitrogen and chloride oversupply. Too much nitrogen. And the plant, again, displays this kind of tip burn. And this is the symptom of N toxicity, nitrogen toxicity in cucumber. Looks like a sick plant. The plant is just healthy, despite for the fact that it is oversupplied with nitrogen. 
So now specifically, some pathogens for tomato. This is a list of fungal pathogens for tomato. <laughs> Who wants to learn them by heart? <laughs> All these can occur on tomato. And you see here, for instance, for the black mold, several different causes, pathogen causes, like Artenaria, Stemphilium, Peronospora, and so on. So again here, my credo, please use the scientific names if you wish to describe a pathogen or a symptom. Usually, if you find diseased plants, you go to a chemistry uh, firm or something like that, to BASF or a Bayer or whatsoever, and you tell them, I got this or that problem and give me something to cure it. In the open field, it works quite well. In a hydroponic system, it sometimes works also quite well, but for an aquaponic system, nothing of all these work. And that is what Heisem comes up later. Uh, by the way, I, I have some provocative state for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so please keep that in mind. What in the open field or in the hydroponic works, it is definitely forbidden, it does not work in aquaponics. Why not? Sorry? Why not? Because it's fish toxic. For the plants it is no problem, so it works in hydroponic. Maybe it works in a cascading system, but then it depends on your separation. Because if something, um, if for instance, imidacloprid, which you use for insect pests, if that comes into your fish water, <laughs> you see many white bellies <laughs> tumbling on the water. <laughs> yeah? Um, sorry, again. Well, hey, play with me. Bacteria diseases. Also on tomato, do I have here? seven, eight bacterial diseases. What can we do about bacterial diseases if we define them? If it dissolves, you can use the antibiotics. Uh oh, not allowed anymore. If it is dissolved. <laughs> there was up till, I hope it is correct right now, 2012. There was, in a special case, in special cases, was antibiotics, at least in the open field, um, admitted for fruits, for apples and pears, for the bacterial wilt. And in the US. And in the US. In the US, still they are applied. In Europe, definitely not. Until 2012, I think it was finally forbidden. In the US, everything is Ask Obama about TTIP. Okay, bacteria. No cure. You can't do anything about it, except for hygienic measures. Then we have a few viruses. Please keep in mind, only for tomato. All this list is only for tomato. No cure. Nothing to do about. So if you have these in your system, you have a severe problem. Why? Why do you have a severe problem with bacteria and viruses in your system? No cure. no cure on the one hand. And what kind of disinfection methods would you apply? For instance, for viruses? Hardly, at least. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yes. It depends on the system. First to these questions. <laughs> no. Let's go on. Plant pathogens in aquaponics for tomato. In fact, it is only those seven. These are the main pathogens that occur on tomato in aquaponic systems. Why not all those others of that list? Any idea? 
Soilborn. Yes, definitely. Soilborn, the one? No vectors or viruses. No vectors, yes, no for viruses, vector. bacteria. Yes, the one? Or, okay. <laughs> come, come, come to that later. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, but, but still, yeah, but still it is correct. And you have not so much problems with airborne pathogens. Might sound a little bit strange, but due to the higher humidity. They can't, simply can't fly as good. But of course, there is cure for all those pathogens we have here. Microbial antagonists. Bacillus, Gliocladium, Potassium bicarbonate in a certain way works also for aquaponic systems. Keep the dose in mind. And what I circled here are pathogens, again Heiser mentioned it, that are leaf pathogens. And the other ones are root pathogens. What makes it so different and what makes it so interesting, that is what I try to bring you now, but there is publication that says beneficial fungi and bacteria that are labeled for disease control in greenhouse tomatoes, hydroponic, aquaponic, or whatsoever. In, praxis, in practice, the efficacy has been variable and unreliable. Hi, Sam. It's your part. Viable and unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you will completely explain that tomorrow. Okay, so I, I'll skip that part. I just got my breath. <laughs> okay. If you have a leaf symptom like this, any idea what it might be? White powdery something on my leaves, on the surface of my leaves. What might it be? Mildew, yes. Which one? Powdery, Powdery or downy? Yeah. Pardon? What is it? <laughs> um, there is an old saying which I would not support, but the old saying is on the leaf is powdery mildew, under the leaf is downy mildew. But if you have a severe attack, it is everywhere. So just don't focus too much on that. In early cases, it helps. But in severe cases, forget it. This is a severe case. <laughs> I think you agree it doesn't matter whether this is the upper or the lower side of the leaf. It's just lost. And here again, powdery mildew. Read the Latin names for yourself. But another thing is you have to deal with synonyms. Newer or older names, even Latin names. And hmm, the older the phytopathologist you're talking to is, <laughs> the older the synonyms are that he uses or she. What makes this powdery mildew so interesting? The name, in fact, gives one of its main characteristics. It's powdery. It forms lots of conidia, just stacked on long chains that are easily air spread. You just can't blow it from the leaf. In a severe case, the sexual cycle of the powder mildew starts and it forms sclerotia or 
Pleistotecia. Different names for all of the same situation. In fact, it is a duration stage, which is formed due to the fact that the fungus kills its own host. Powder mildew is a um, <laughs> it depends on living um, host um, vessels. Sorry? Obligate parasite. Obligate parasite. Thank you. <laughs> so if the leaf is structured like this, if it's burning down, the milieu only has one chance to survive to form surviving stages. In a better situation, these can again grow and reinfect young and healthy plants. So this brings one very important aspect for all the production systems, either hydroponic or aquaponic. Keep your hygienic situation as good as possible. Remove all debris, remove all diseased, remove all old plant parts as quick as possible and as complete as possible. Because otherwise, with these duration stages, you will never get rid of diseases. Another picture. Unfortunately, they're too, not too good. Gray mold. This is an early stage gray mold on a tomato fruit. And this, maybe you remember, Botrytis cinerea, is these characteristical fruiting bodies, which you can see on the leaves on the plant. So if you are a little bit familiar with those symptoms and with the way of infection, you maybe not need to follow the Koch's postulates that you just can see and identify with your own eyes within seconds. Much cheaper and much faster than any ELISA or any PCR. The problem is the early stage of Botrytis and Phytophthora late blight is almost similar. And in this case, you can use a trick to take a shortcut for the Cox postulates. Remove such a leaf, put it into a moist chamber. Means take a, a, a plastic bag, put a wet filter paper in it, put the leaf on it, cover it, and let it stand for, let's say, two or three days at room temperature. Most pathogens will develop those fruiting stages then on your leaf, which they usually do not on your plant in your system. And that is a means of taking a shortcut for the Koch's postulates to identify the pathogen. Botrytis, also just like powdery mildew, forms lots of spores that are easily air spread and thus infect large quantity of plants, large areas of leaves and also it can form sclerotia, duration stages and again keep your system clean, please. This one, Phytophthora and Festans, one of the most dangerous and most feared diseases not only in tomato production but also in potato production because potato and tomato are so closely related that this pathogen kills both within days. I've seen potato fields that had a severe Phytophthora infection on Monday and the next Monday the complete field was brown. It was gone. And I'm talking about two or three hectares. It is just like fire into draw straw. Yeah? So this one, extremely important, extremely dangerous, displaying these symptoms on the tomato. If it is moist enough, it forms mycelium and also 
fruiting bodies. If it is not moist enough in an earlier stage, you get these brownish tomatoes that very readily start to, to soften and to stink. This one stinks very characteristic. So again, the, the earlier speech, use organoleptic means of identification. And what makes this one so special or so dangerous too, especially for our aquaponic systems, this one forms spores, but they are not wind dispersed, but it forms zoospores that swim actively in water, in a water film. So they go not only with the water direction in your system, but they can also go again, against the water direction. And they go through the water, through everything, without any means of control if you are not early enough to stop it. Petium, damping off. This is no tomato, this is a pepper, but nevertheless, symptoms are the same. Leaf symptoms, early leaf symptoms, looking almost like late blight. But for Petium, it is in fact a root disease. That means the main characteristics you will find at the base of the roots, uh, at the base of the stem where the roots start to develop. And sometimes you find this, well, mycelium yellowish, hmm, debris at the base. And if you look through a microscope, you find in the roots those fruiting bodies. And again, those, this petium is an oomycete, as this whole group of water dispersible pathogens is called. Again, forming zoospores that are transferred through the water and are extremely infectious. You had a question? Yeah, same symptoms. Um, I will display a few other diseases later on, but remember those root diseases are usually in a so-called complex. That means it is normally not only one causing pathogen, but it's at least two or three. The combination of petium, fusarium, sometimes verticillium, rhizoctonia, those are quite common and usually together displaying those symptoms. When you come to that, next one, damping off rhizoctonia. Just remember the first picture. Also, down at the stem, this mycelium, this drying fruit, displaying these kind of well, rolling of the epidermal layer. And you find in a microscope this characteristic mycelium. Remember, brick-like brick -like septation and rectangular branching. Rhizoctonia. But this one does not form spores. As you know, still, it is <clears throat> one of the aqueous or water molds together with Petium and Phytophthora. And these three pathogens, again, maybe together with Fusarium and Verticillium, are the root diseases that most commonly occur in hydroponic or aquaponic systems. And this is Fusarium. In this case, Fusarium oxysporum forma specialis lycopersici. Forma specialis. That means that of the species Fusarium oxysporum are a lot of various subspecies, Formae specialis, specifically adapted to specific hosts. This Lycopersici goes for tomato, but not for cauliflower, but not for cucumber. That is other Formae specialis. Until now, 
you can use the same, at least in the field, the same sprays against it. But also here, the selectivity of chemical means of plant protection split and the forma specialis develop resistances. This is the symptom on tomato. And the fusarium wilt usually brings this brownish interior of the stem. It's often the, um, the inside part of the stem is, well, let's say digested. The stem gets hollow. And in early infection phases, you can see this sometimes reddish um, vessels, transport vessels, xylem and phloem vessels that are affected. And this fusarium is quite easy to identify if you have a microscope because it has very characteristic banana-like spores. Very long, stretched banana-like spores. At least the most of them, of course, there are species that do not fall, fall under this characterization. And another thing of those fusarium species is they form toxins. So the damage they do is not only due to the fact that, the that they kill the plant. Sometimes you won't see them in the plant. They can grow systemically, not hurting the plant, endophyte-like. But still they can display the toxins. I have no idea of the importance in tomato production, but at least in cereals, in wheat, it is extremely important. Because it can ruin your complete harvest. There are borders, borderlines of um, toxicity concentration in wheat in Europe. It is um, 125 ppm. That is quite easy to reach for this fungus. And then you have no harvest, then you need to extra um, get rid of your crop. You can't just dump it, you have to burn it, you have to pay for that. And this is verticillium wilt. Again, a pathogen that penetrates the roots, that mainly is present in the vessels, in the xylem vessels of the plant. And one characteristic of this pathogen is that in early stages, part of the plant start yellowing and wilting, not the entire plant, usually half-sided. That is one characteristic item of verticillium, wilt. Yeah, okay. And then off from the fungi to the viruses, this is a picture or are pictures of the tomato spotted wilt virus. Just to show that it is not only fungi, fungi that attack our, part, our plants. And it is important to know most viruses are spread, spread by insects. This one is coupled to thrips. Other viruses are coupled to aphids. Others are, of, are coupled to spider mites and so on. So the knowledge of the host and um, vector system is extremely important to prevent yourself from virus infections. And here we have some of those insect plant pathogens, especially white flies, spider mites, and so on. And they can be um, counterparted by different chemical substances, but also by predators, insect or microbial predators or antagonists. What is this kind of a disease or pest? Any idea? I hope no one of you has seen this one. Mites, spider mites. 
This is the magnification. <laughs> <laughs> and in severe cases, oh, just no, I, have to, I haven't that picture here. In severe, in severe cases, it is a little bit to see here. It is just like a spider web covering your entire plant. And all those little mites hovering up and fro on these spider or in the spider net. Any idea what this is? Looks almost the same. And that is the strips. <laughs> Draw your own conclusions. And this is the white fly, or white moth, or whatsoever, one of the most important insect pests in tomato. Okay, that was tomato. Do we need a break? <laughs> Heisam just smiles and doesn't say anything. Okay, so I continue. <laughs> Again, the fungi. First, powdery mildew on lettuce. Early stage, you can't see anything of those powdery mycelium. Severe stage, it turns white. This is downy mildew. Looks almost the same. Now you can say, okay, this is a crops, uh, crop lettuce, so in fact that is the underneath side of the leaf. But still, I warn you, please do not refer to that um, characteristic singularly. And this browning wilting also is displayed by downy mildew. This is another pathogen, drop as it's called, sclerotinia minor. And if you look, to the severe symptom and to the sclerotia that are formed. You can see them here. Maybe it rings a bell to the pathogen that I introduced in the other talk when I showed you the artificial inoculation of winter oilseed rape. That, is the big, that was the big brother of this one. By the way, sclerotinia sclerotiorum, the one that attacks winter oilseed rape, has no host specificity. It attacks sunflower, it attacks tomato, it attacks dahlias, it attacks uh, lettuces, it attacks um, a tomato, it attacks almost everything. Even beans and even grasses. All is attacked by one and the same fungus, sclerotinia sclerotiorum. This is minor, minor, the small brother. Yeah. And this again is a pitium, here displayed on lettuce. And this can happen if you suffer from pitium in your earliest stage. Sanitary problem, in fact. The roots turn brown and the stem becomes hollow. Again, viruses the big vein virus of, of lettuce. Tomato spotted wilt virus looks a little bit like downy mildew. Again here, this one in a moist chamber will never develop fruiting bodies. It just will continue to rot. Keep this shortcut for the Cox postulates in mind. Bacterial leaf Xanthomonas campestris. Again, Patova vitans. This Patova is pathogenic to lettuce. The Patova graminis is pathogenic to grass. Soft rot, another bacterium. If you see this picture, you know why it's called soft rot. <laughs> it starts to slime the entire um, plant, in fact, gets, well, diluted. And last but not least, the insects. Probably all know these ones, aphids. But do you know that one? 
What is this? Whitish. Any idea? <laughs> Got you. This is dead efforts. <laughs> After spraying. Which brings me to another point. If you apply any kind of remediation method, you, do, you need not suspect that your pathogen or whatsoever completely vanishes. It isn't gone with the wind. It sometimes is dead or it stops growing. But often it still is there. So don't mis under, uh, misinterpret. This is a lettuce plant I found a few weeks ago in our system. I had no idea what it could be. Anybody of you who has any idea what this might be? Uh, it is upside down, by the way. This here were the roots. Here is the leaves. <laughs> Close. I brought it into the lab and had a look, had a closer look under the microscope to find this one. A larva. This smart little <clears throat> pardon me for the word I was just thinking of. The dark winged fungus gnat. It is in every culture, soil, soilless, aquaponic, hydroponic, or whatsoever, it is a severe pathogen. It is a Little black flying bastard <laughs> that, yet you, that you hardly can avoid. But it's always present. And if you see this kind of symptom, you should have a look for this little gnat. Another way of checking if you have these gnats is yellow glue stickers. That is another means of control of, call it biocontrol, for your system. Use yellow, blue, and maybe even white glue stickers. Yellow stickers attract these gnats. Blue ones attract trips. White ones attract whoever comes. <laughs> but yellow and blue are the most typical for those two insect pests. Yes. Okay. Questions? If not, then I thank for your attention. <laughs>